Anybody, you can. Got it. He was going to tell us about new approaches to apparent polar wander path development uh, with a case study of the late Meso Mesoproterozoic of Virginia. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to make this presentation today at our conference. Um, uh, we'll resume the discussion of apparent polar wander path uh, synthesis after a coffee, coffee break. Here, I hope to provide you with a refreshing field, field picture in the Grand Canyon showing uh, this major intrusion. Uh, uh, as as deck was in a hackaday shale, and then uh, you know, the region, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. And then developed into the shale, uh, uh, into the shale, uh, in between the hackaday uh, shale and the shinimo foot Uh To start, I want to acknowledge our um, collaborators who got involved into data development and methodology development into the um, approaches to synthesize a parapolar wonder path I'm going to introduce in the rest of the presentation. Ian Rose was a PhD student at UC Berkeley. James Pierce uh, was a, a undergraduate student in our group. Ferris Thostic, now a professor at Dartmouth, uh, was, P uh, was a postdoc with us. Um, Baku uh, Sapienza is now a current PhD student at Berkeley Data Science and the project uh, advised by uh, Professor Nick von Heisel. Um, and uh, uh, the second um, approach to apparent, apparent polar one but past synthesis uh, builds all from the work led by Leandro Gajo, uh, Matt Domia at um, uh, University of Oslo, and uh, uh, also benefit from discussion with uh, people involved in a uh, um, uh, small conference uh, at the Center for Earth Evolution and Dynam Dy Dynamics. And I also want to acknowledge a funding source from NSF and uh, Berkeley's Peter Sether Center. So I want to start off with the uh, this paper led by Dave Evans, showing the, an expanding list of reliable paleomagnetic poles for Precambrian tectonic reconstructions. Here on the right, we can see this cumulative uh, increase in cumulative number of A-grade poles, which are high uh, quality poles determined by a group of uh, paleomagnetists who gather around every few years and sit together to determine the high quality uh, paleomagnetic pole positions and associated geochronology with uh, of a compilation of uh, developed paleomagnetic um, data uh, for various continents. And we can see this increase in the past years. And thanks for this community effort, we now have uh, this, although uh, tens to 100 uh, number of poles for each continent is still uh, small relative to the vast history of pre-Cambrian time, but we now start to have, have um, efforts in terms of uh, building a parent polar water path for each constant and put them into context with each other to build into a global tectonic framework in deep, in deep time. And the challenge, uh, the first and, and uh, perhaps foremost challenge uh, of these efforts is to how to quantitatively constrain a parent polar water path for these continents and put them together. And so before going in detail, I want to introduce or remind of us uh, of the pole nomenclature I'm gonna use uh, throughout the rest of the presentation today. So here, well, the first uh, slide, I presented a picture of the uh, Grand Canyon. So I, I grabbed the stratigraphic section uh, of some ongoing work uh, from the canyon. Here we're looking at a stack of lava flows and they're separated by uh, oftenly interflow sediments, or you can recognize individual lava flows by their vesicular flow count. And so, our, um, oftenly in our paleomagnetic sample uh, hierarchy, we would collect samples from a single individual lava flow and consider uh, each lava flow records uh, a single snapshot of the geomagnetic field. And I will call a lava flow uh, a site and we refer it to a uh, site de developed from uh, individual level flows, site level pole or virtual geomagnetic pole, VGP. And we commonly will calculate uh, a mean pole position from the site level uh, pole, uh, uh, pole positions. And we'll call these mean poles study level poles or paleomagnetic poles. The first challenge in quantitative apparent polar one path uh, reconstruction is uh, the consideration uh, or the lack of consideration of our sun uh, of our sun view. And uh, conventionally, we would fit uh, spline path, spline curves 
through the mean pale magnet pole position, so study level pole positions. And there's no uh, uncertainty regarding pole position and not uh, certainly not the, uh, the age associated with these pale magnet poles considered in the spine fit. Another commonly used um, method is the running mean calculation where you run a, uh, uh, a running mean window through uh, the study level pole positions and calculate Fisher mean of these uh, poles that fall into a certain um, age bracket. And in this method also, uh, no uncertainty in the pole position and age is considered. And furthermore, you would bias your calculated mean pole position toward areas where you have more data. And I want to illustrate uh, the issues associated with running mean by using the paleomagnet data uh, developed from the mesoproterozoic Laurentia parent pole on the path. Here on the left, we're seeing the paleomagnet poles developed uh, from mostly the mid continent rift area shown in this right, uh, red patch here. Here we're seeing uh, North America continents kind of rotated on this side. The East Coast today is here, West Coast today is facing North, and we're somewhere here in the middle of the red. Okay, most of the rock uh, record uh, that we see on the left are developed in this region, and we can see this progression of paleomagnetic poles from uh, the high latitudes to the equator. The purple color is associated with older poles, and the yellow color, lighter color, is associated with younger poles. We can see um, that uh, the pole position uh, relative to today's continent uh, configuration. Uh, starting from older to younger, the older poles are closer to North American right continent and the younger poles away from it. And in context, this is sort of uh, uh, showing the uh, results uh, uh, of, of the presentation first. In context uh, of tectonics, what we're seeing is uh, North American continent being close to the, to the pole and then traveling fast toward, uh, toward the equator. Okay. And here I want to really show what data we're missing, what uncertainty we're missing to represent in the uh, process of calculating a running mean. On the left, we're, we're seeing the pale magnet poles, the observed data associated with the uncertainty in pole position and their associated age uncertainties. These age distributions show our constraints associated with each pole, either by radiometric dating, so uh, represented by normal distribution, uh, by methods such as uh, radiometric uranium-led uh, zircon uh, geochronology, or they are represented by a uniform distribution, say constrained by such uh, uranium-led zircon data, but in a stratigraphic context. On the right, we are seeing what we are, uh, what the uh, algorithms really see in, in the running mean approach. Running mean, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, the pole position uncertainty associated with each mean pole, and we don't see any of the uh, age uncertainty associated with, with them. Instead, you see single values associated with a single pole position. And when you do a running mean calculation, you would draw this moving average window in terms of age, and then see which poles would fall into this window, and then calculate the running mean off of these, of these poles. And that would be one of the uh, running mean uh, result. But how should we, we need to uh, incorporate the uncertainty into uh, the running mean calculation. Um, and one uh, way of incorporating pole position uncertainty into a parent polar one pass synthesis was introduced by Rich Gordon in 1984. In this paper, he introduced uh, to our community the Euler pole rotation uh, uh, idea. He says, just as constant force in the plate produce linear motion on the surface of a sphere, constant torque applied to a plate produce motion along a small circle. So here at the Euler pole, Above that Euler pole, you can uh, you have uh, absolute plate motion and associated with the recorded apparent pole polar wander path. And here, using synthetic paleomagnet pole data shown by these triangles and associated uh, uncertainty uh, ellipses, he uh, resampled uh, the pole position given these associated uncertainties, and then calculated the best fit small circle that goes through the paleomagnet poles. And here, the result ellipse distribution of these uh, squares are the resulted calculated Euler pole positions. And here, uh, here's another example of that synthetic data set. But the, uh, it's nice that this, uh, this uh, method uh, incorporates pole position uncertainty into the calculation, but no age information is included. And therefore, in this 
a small circle fit, fitting routine, you don't have any information about whether these poles are swapping from right to left, left to right, or jumping uh, all around. And so Ian Rose, when he was a PhD student at Berkeley working on this project with, with Nick, he expanded uh, the Euler pole uh, algorithm to, be a, a, to put it in a Bayesian framework, and then instead ask the question, what do the probability distribution look like for Euler pole positions and Euler pole rotation rates and associated paleomagnetic pole ages that can describe the observed paleomagnetic pole positions? So by running a Bayesian inversion framework, we can see the resultant uh, one Euler pole inversion um, uh, scenario. This is the inverted Euler pole position distributions. And with all associated Euler pole uh, positions, you can estimate the Euler pole rotation rate and associated or predicted uh, ages associated with each of those observed paleomagnetic poles. So if we look at the resultant Euler pole rotation, statistics. On the left, I'm showing interpreted, or if we interpret all of the polar motion to be attributed to, to plate tectonic motion, we're seeing uh, a distribution centered around three degrees per million years, and that translates to about 30 centimeters per year of quite rapid, uh, one more, or perhaps one of the most rapid plate tectonic motion we've seen in, in Earth's history. And to, to, uh, to uh, convert this, this result into plate uh, tectonic implied plate, uh, plate tectonic motion, we see Laurentia uh, still in this rotated uh, position and moved rapidly from high latitude to toward the equator. But the flexibility of the Bayesian inversion framework is you can uh, toggle with your forward model and then uh, instead of uh, uh, constructing one oil pole inversion scenario, you can try to fit for a uh, two-stage pole uh, scenario. And here we're showing the two-stage pole inversion result with the blue-colored Euler pole positions associated with the, the former part of the apparent polar, apparent polar one path and the green distribution associated with the latter half of the apparent polar one path. Comparison, the two-stage pole inversion result and the one Euler pole inversion result have quite similar but distinct uh, predicted ages associated with um, each pair of magnetic poles. If we do the same exercise and look at the interpreted plate tectonic motion given by the two stage pole inversion scenario, we can see that the earlier portion represented blue color um, still show this really rapid plate tectonic motion. And then you experience a slowdown in the latter half. And the associated uh, re reconstruction of Laurentius plate motion is shown on the left. You can still see this rapid latitude, uh, latitudinal motion from uh, high latitude to toward the equator. And what's nice about this inversion approach is that you let the data decide when it's uh, the plate tectonic motion change from the first uh, oil pole to the second. And the data shows that the posterior distribution of this, the time at which it switched from the first to the second is about uh, 1097 million years uh, with 95% credible interval between 1099 and 1095. And what this would mean uh, in terms of tectonic implication, uh, when we compare this statistical approach result with the compilation of the Grenville uh, collisional orogenesis uh, metamorphism record in terms of uh, zircon and metamorphic zircon and monzonite age, and we plot this inversion result uh, uh, bracketed between 1095 and 1099. Here we can see this overlaps with one of the oldest uh, uh, monazite ages. And this is consistent uh, with uh, Lorenzo first really rapidly traveled from high latitude toward uh, mid latitude and perhaps associated with the onset of a uh, Grenville uh, uh, origin uh, uh, commands. Uh, commencement uh, near the pre present day uh, East Coast and uh, caused the slowdown in uh, Laurentia plate motion, although it still kept quite rapid uh, rate uh, traveling toward the equator. And what I want to, uh, another thing I want to highlight here is, and I find it quite fascinating, is that previously if we focused on the non such formation uh, pole position represented by this green uh, pole there, 
we don't have a tight constraint on the age of the sedimentary pole. And here, the prior uh, knowledge represented here by the uniform age distribution is between about 1085 MA and 1070 MA. But after the inversion, it is because we impose this Euler pole rotation and we use all the information embedded in the age constraint and pole position of all the paleomagnetic poles here, we can derive an, uh, a posterior prediction of what non such age uh, would be. And here, the 95% uh, pre predicted credible interval of the age of a non such formation is about 1078 uh, with uh, uh, confidence uh, around. 1082 and 1073. If we compare this result with the rhenium osmium radiometric data on non this is 1078. I think it's quite interesting. Okay, uh, so uh, here with the first um, uh, Bayesian framework inversion method, I presented the advances um, associated with this um, approach that it naturally incorporates age uncertainty, it allows pole age inferences they allow quantitative tectonic interpretations and model comparisons as such, uh, such as the one where the pole and two where the pole scenario. But the challenge is that it does impose this oil pole rotation and assumes stable uh, oil pole position as well as rotation rate for a period of time, uh, maybe as long as tens of millions of years. And it imposes rapid change points between oil poles in the model. And also it uses study level paleomagnetic poles and we toss away the site level uncertainties associated with our site level data. And so perhaps another alternative approach to synthesize the q and RN track is to improve the running mean method so that you are actually incorporating uncertainties associated with age and pole position. And so this work builds off of um, uh, the Gajo et al. 2023 paper, we propagate uncertainty from site level. Exciting news is that uh, this paper just become available on the web yesterday. Uh, and so I want to uh, uh, demonstrate the power of this second method uh, with, uh, again, the QNR and track, but this time I went in and compiled all the site level uh, VGP data uh, associated with the QNR and track. And when you demonstrate what uh, site level um, uncertainty in terms of direction space uh, here. And so, so on the equal area plot, equal area plot on the right, I'm plotting one of the older, also the upper, uh, upper reverse um, uh, pole position uh, on the left and the site level direction uh, on the right. You can see this pile of site level directions and they're associated off 95 uncertainties, uh, particularly uh, shown by these uh, ellipses is what we toss away when you calculate uh, conventionally uh, paleomagnetic pole. And the idea in this approach is that we actually uh, resample the sample level direction uh, uh, associated with each site level mean uh, directions, and then convert these uh, resampled directions into a, uh, a running mean, running mean um, uh, algorithm. So here I want to start off with the VGPs from volcanic rocks in the Kiwan Island track. And all the VGP are shown on the, on the left and they're associated uh, age and uncertainties are shown on, on the right. And previously, if you remember that we have another issue regarding the bias you would potentially introduce uh, when you do a conventional running mean approach, That's, that is you would, you would bias your calculated uh, mean pole positions toward where you have more data. In this case, the red bracket shows one of the uh, imaginary uh, age uh, brackets. Uh, and here, because we have a few more holes centered around here, uh, you would potentially bias the pole position, mean pole position you calculate in this running mean approach toward these power poles instead of toward the, and by assign the age uh, of these, of the calculated mean pole as the central age associated with this bracket. And one way uh, Gajo et al. Uh, in that uh, uh, algorithm um, uh, figured to mitigate this, this issue is instead of just uh, uh, do uh, a mean of all the, of the pole position, you would resample those pole position uh, along this kind of triangular shaped kernel so that you weight your resample by the age uh, of the poles so that you preferentially more resample the, the, those poles that are near the uh, central edge of the window and therefore mitigate uh, the 
by the bias issue. So here I'm showing the result of the resampled running mean poles with 20 million year window and one million year time step. And you can see the resultant uh, running mean path here. At the end, you see more of the uncertainties that, that is just because we don't have uh, much data near the, near the end of the path here. But in the Mekong Rift, there's way more data. And those data are from the sedimentary rock records. But the problem with sedimentary poles is that uh, the issue of inclination shallowing. And you can see on the left, I'm plotting three sedimentary formations. One, cut face, the dark, uh, dark green cut face sandstone, uh, just in, uh, near Grand Marais, north of here, uh, and uh, uh, non-such formation and Frida formation in uh, lighter green and yellow color. You can notice that the distribution of these VGPs are not tertiarian. And that's because the site level uh, directions are, are shallow. And, uh, the, and the reason is because social deposition and post deposition compaction, you have rotation of uh, uh, magnetic grains uh, toward the bedding plane. And this uh, incl inclination shallowing uh, phenomenon is described by that you have observed inclination and uh, uh, shallows from the inclination of the field during deposition. And the tangent of the observed inclination uh, equals uh, this F factor, inclination factor, times the tangent of the uh, inclination of the field uh, in which the sediments were deposited. And I would refer you uh, to our Dario's uh, fantastic uh, summary of uh, inclination shallowing issue by this RM quality, the do's and don'ts of inclination shallowing corrections, together with uh, Dario and Ken's uh, many work uh, uh, in, this, in, in this field. And particularly, I want to highlight this uh, uh, paragraph uh, um, Dario put in a 2011 paper that, however, the error associated with measurements has not been propagated through the corrections and the reported uncertainties are simply the over 95% confidence circle of the corrected directions. Dario recognized this in 2011 and illustrated this, this issue of people not propagating properly or at all the uncertainties associated with inclination shelling factor um, here. And so by progressively or uh, calculating the possible corrected directions and plotting them in the equal area plot, you can see this pile of possible um, uh, 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 corrected directions on the right. And we should incorporate the uncertainties uh, in the inclination correction in a parent polar one, one path synthesis. I also want to highlight uh, our work with uh, James Pierce when he was doing his um, undergrad uh, thesis uh, here and using a different uh, approach than uh, uh, what Dario uses a lot, which is measurement-based and anthropy uh, measurement uh, method. And here we went to the Cafe Sandstone uh, uh, in Northern Minnesota. And here we were able to isolate the detritus remnant component shown in green here, and also, uh, and from the chemical remnant component shown in red. And what's nice about Cafe Sandstone is that it's bracketed by, uh, on top and below by rapidly in, in placed uh, lava flows of the Mekong Rift. So in this case, we know where the inclination should be. And also we, we know that the, uh, we, we see that the chemical remnant component direction uh, uh, shares a common mean with the uh, with the whole and lava flow inclination directions. And, and we can see here that the tidal remnant component is indeed shallowed. And by, by progressively unshallow the detrital remnant component in cafe sandstone and, and perform common mean, uh, uh, common mean uh, uh, calculation uh, with the volcanic directions, we can then uh, derive what the uh, known or what the true uh, effect uh, inclination correction factor for the cafe sandstone should be. And then, we used uh, uh, the statistical approach developed by Lisa Tokes um, and Dennis Ken in 2004, the EI method known by the community, which is the uh, which is method of comparing the corrected shape of the distribution of geomagnetic site directions with that of an expected um, geomagnetic field model. And here, by, by correcting your observed data uh, by, uh, with F factors and the measure of the elongation parameter, which measures 
the shape of the tailing tailing uh, direction until it matches with this black curve, which is predicted by the field model. Until they intersect, you will derive uh, statistically the expected uh, f factor. And by bootstrap resample the direction to get a sense of the uncertainty of the shape of the distribution, you then have a measure of your uncertainty in the f factor correction. And here, the EI correction uh, uh, is, shown, is shown on the left compared to our empirical uh, compar comparison. And in this occasion, we have 157 sites, 157 time snapshots of the field. And we still have an uncertainty in terms of paleo latitude of about 15 degrees, 10 degrees. And that uncertainty needs to be incorporated into, uh, uh, needs to be very in mind. And here I also show the progressively uh, 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 corrected direction on the left and color coded by the F a value a bracket by zero to one and show this gray cloud of all uh, possible corrected um, site level BGP directions. And in this case, we choose to use a Kent distribution to represent the uncertainty of pole position and associated inclination shallowing. And by adding these uh, all available sedimentary uh, paleomagnetic data into the compilation of QNR on track, we extend the uh, running mean approach result uh, to much younger time. And here I'm showing uh, by splitting uh, the result into uh, latitude and longitude space. We can see, just like what we see previously, latitudinally, we see this uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, motion uh, of the polar wander from high latitude to low latitude. In terms of longitude, you can see this bend in the longitude uh, around uh, 10, uh, 10, 8, uh, 7 MA. And if you remember our previous results using the Bayesian inversion framework, the uh, data determines uh, switch point and associated credible interval, 95% credible interval is around 1097 with interval from uh, 1095 to 1099 uh, on the right. And this, these two models, uh, where these two methods come from uh, very different model construction and with different assumptions. But, uh, uh, the, but the cool result is that they uh, uh, really agree in terms of the uh, result. Okay, and then here I'm comparing the two reconstructed plate motion implied by weighted running mean approach and then the Bayesian uh, oil pole inversion approach on left and right. And they're really looking quite similar. You probably would notice that uh, uh, there's a bit more slowdown and more details embedded on the, on the left than compared to the right. And that is because on the left, you are uh, averaging uh, uh, site level uh, BGPs and on the, on the right, you're assuming a constant or the pole rotation. And so now that we have a uh, well-constrained apparent polar wander path and associated plate tectonic reconstruction for Laurentia in the late Mesoproterozoic, we can then put this in context of the global tectonic reconstruction and then start to look at Laurentia's uh, uh, paleogeography evolution around that time in association with other ancient continents. Plot on the right, Show, uh, shows that near the end of the QNR, in fact, you have Laurentia sitting in the center of supercontinent Rodinia and uh, having the Granville um, uh, or orogeny uh, between Laurentia and uh, continents um, such as Amazonia and, and Kalahari. And really now we can start to use this uh, reconstructed paleogeography to test uh, hypothesis associated with the connection between Laurentia and other, uh, other continents. And one example I want to give is our group uh, also has been um, uh, generating more data into the early Neoproterozoic. Here shown on the left, the red reconstruction shows uh, circa 990 MA Jacobsville formation pole position, which implies that between the end of q and time, which is about 1070 MA to 990 MA, Lorenzo probably had little uh, uh, latitudinal motion um, with a slight change in its orientation. And this implied position by the, the Jacobsville pole, which is in the interior of Lorenzo, is 
different than the position implied by the Grenville uh, uh, poles uh, developed from Grenville uh, metamorphic rocks. And those poles were previously interpreted to be circa 1015 to 970 MA. And this uh, stark contrast and distinct uh, implied uh, uh, plate uh, positions by these uh, paleomagnetic data sets uh, can be then further uh, tested by going into um, a more paleomagnetic investigation, say in the Grenville province. Another example is that recently there has been uh, papers uh, questioning the relative position of Laurentia and Baltica and potentially arguing that perhaps uh, Grenville and Baltica did not uh, uh, come together until much later in the Phanerozoic. And with the reconstructed path for Laurentia, now we can uh, then go into, uh, say, uh, more data investigation from Baltica and test these questions further. And so I think I will leave uh, the, uh, the path through Bayesian inversion and the path through weighted running mean here and conclude. Thank you. Do you think that was a really great talk? I don't know if you see. Do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Question one. Roger. Uh, just quickly, uh, did you did you run any um, you know, likelihood analysis, for example, to quantify like how justified it is to, to have the two? Different uh, different oil, oil model instead of the one. The Bayesian inversion framework, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. To right. Totally. And I have a slide for that. Uh, give me a second. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, maybe we simplify it. Okay. We'll just use that. Right. So here, yes, you can calculate posterior log likelihood distribution for different scenarios, and actually, we ran more. Uh, uh, more scenarios than the two that I have presented. And here you can see the one Euler rotation uh, and be minded that this is log likelihood uh, sits here and then the two Euler has, uh, is just a much better fit. Yeah, if you think about the sense of fitting the pyramid uh, Yes, two for one there, it turns out to be quite bad fit. Um, so I've got two questions. Yes. Um, first one, is your priors. Yeah. So you base those on the data, is that right? Uh, yes, and there, there are a range of priors you can set depending on what, which parameter you're thinking about. Okay. Right, or the position or the rotation rate. Okay, so right. in a normal uh, Bayesian analysis, do you set your priors before you make any observation? Yes. But your priors have been set by your data. And my priors? My data. So, uh, okay, if I, so if, if I understood right. correctly, for example, the prize on the ages were the experimental right. uncertainties on the ages. Yes, yes. And the likelihood calculation is only based on your predicted pole position given a certain age, uh, measured by the observed pole positions. Okay. Yes. So I think so, maybe then what, what you've done is empirical phase rather than phase. Okay. But anyway, okay. That maybe that's just a pedantic point, but normally for Bayesian analysis, you, you set your price before you observe anything. I see. You set your price based on your data. I, I it's, it's an empirical Bayesian inversion in that case, but maybe that's just um, slightly pedantic. But um, for, the, for the switch point that you're talking about, right. um, so you showed the posterior for that. Yeah. What's the prior on that? There, there is, uh, there is no. So it's a uniform distribution from the oldest pole to the, to the youngest pole. Okay, so, that, so the switch point that's it's a uniform prior just between the, yep. the oldest and the youngest. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. You can use uh, a more uh, informed prior. Uh, say you run a running mean first. I don't know. I don't think you need to, given, yes, given that's, how tight the final answer is. It's, it's that's right that's true. Used a pretty non-informed. Prior that's and come out like that. that's true. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. Thank, Thank you. you. And and regarding the first first point, I guess uh, uh, you're you're right. And then, but the good thing about it is that you spend a ton of research funding and time and efforts in terms of developing zircon radiometric dates, and then you can build this into 
the framework and only use paleomagnetic pole position to evaluate how good the model is. Perhaps that's uh, uh, absolutely an advantage. Yeah, I, I think that's something worth, worth doing rather than just setting everything with some informative bias. When you yeah. have the information, you should use it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I have a question for yes. you. Um, so for the sedimentary rock formations, you have the non touch and right. the other sandstone. Right. Would you be able to measure the anisotropy and do your own corrections there? And the reason I ask this is that in both corrections, it needs to be eyed and the anisotropy correction generally will do. You're correcting the XD thing, the magnification. So the definition remains fixed before and after correction. Yes. Right? Yes. But if you do correct for the full answer of the anisotropy, you can actually also vary the definition of the correct direction. So since you have a beautiful data set and you have a comparison already of two different techniques, I'm wondering if you have the other level of complication. I think that would be uh, totally interesting to do. We we should we should try that. And and the uh, the running mean approach. I think uh, I haven't done such a, a, a measurement and correction. But perhaps I think the running mean approach will allow you to incorporate uncertainties in both directions. Perhaps uh, in um, in the synthesis. So that could be could be a good way to build everything into the compilation. Yeah. Cool. All right, I guess we're going to move on to the next talk by Daria.